Are the glory days of Continental gone forever? Um, probably, but uh, with that thought in mind, I'd like to share with you some of the things that I experienced um, during my career with Continental. I was with Continental from 1972 to 1982. I began my career out in far off Burbank. I couldn't get into Continental to save my life. And um, through a long series of circumstances, I figured that if I got into Continental in Burbank and I was with the company, I'd know far more than if I was on the outside. Um, how did I come to be standing here? Last year, the Flight Path Museum invited me to come up here and say a few words about Robert F6 and the plaque that was installed uh, near LAX. And the other reason is that after a few years in Burbank, I got to know Continental's Vice President in Los Angeles, Jack Tobin. Uh, Jack and I got on very well together, and then one day he said to me, he said, John, would you put together a newspaper for the Los Angeles region? And I said, I'd love to. And I said to him, well, now, how many pages do you have right now for this publication? He said, John, we just have one. I said, okay. Um, I said, what about the budget? And Jack and I had got to know each other very well, and he said to me, oh, I don't know, John, just, just do whatever you want. So I did, and I came out with a 12-page publication. Um, I think when Jack got the bill, he was a little surprised, but the magazine met with a lot of uh, accolades, and of course, I was very thrilled. I put out three issues every I put out one issue for three months, and then the fourth month came, and on the fourth month came Joe Daly, the Vice President of Public Relations for Continental Airlines, called me into his office and asked me if I would like to be in Continental's Public Relations. And I must have said something like, is the Pope Catholic? And that was the beginning of a very wonderful long career in public relations for Continental. I was very fortunate to experience a lot of interesting, wonderful, and newsy events in public relations. And I would like to share some of those things with you today. I don't know how many Continental people there are in the audience, but um, I happen to be wearing my Continental tie uh, when I start on the ticket counter. Uh, when I, uh, I was given two of these ties and the museum asked me if they could have one of them and in the museum over there in the Continental section you will see my other tie. I also happen to be wearing my John Clayton badge that I wore on the ticket counter and when I was pinning it on this morning I said to myself wait a minute, do you realize I wore that over 40 years ago? Oh, dear me. Um, I would rather be young, but then again, um, uh, people like you and me, we can get up every day, so uh, that's the other thing about getting older. Um, Continental Airlines, the proud bird with a golden tail, one of the things that I really loved about Continental, and there were so many things, I had never worked for a company before where there was pride in working for a company. They were really proud of what they did, of who we were, and everything like that. And as I, you know, as each week passed into months, I could see the real dramatic effect that having that kind of thing was on Continental and the, in the people who worked there. One day when I was traveling around our system, a reporter from a newspaper um, said to me, well, John, how would you describe Continental employees? And so I said to him, well, I think it really is like the US Marine Corps. The Continental employees were the few and the proud. Of course, if you work for Continental, while that was a wonderful slogan, Continental people really saw this. If everybody could get into the Marines, it wouldn't be the Marines. Now, Continental, we felt it was, if everybody could get into Continental Airlines, it really wouldn't be Continental. The pride that we had was uh, very special, and I am very glad to say that I was part of that team. When I'd been with Continental about a year, we had a big marketing function at the Marriott Hotel, 
and we, the Public Liberations Department, put on a display there and the headline, we're good for what ails you, and they had me sit there dressed up as a doctor. And it really expressed the kind of feeling uh, that people had for Continental. Um, Robert F. Six. If you had told me when I joined Continental and was putting bags on our aircraft out in Burbank, I would have said to you that it was very hard to think that one day I would be standing here talking to you about what I am. In 1985, United Airlines, and how ironic is that, that Continental is now part of United, United Airlines went on strike for 29 days with their pilots. Continental, uh, in our flights to Hawaii, obviously when they were on strike, United didn't fly to Hawaii. Continental then put on six extra flights a day to take care of all the business to Hawaii. Um, I was so thrilled with that that I wrote a letter to the LA Times talking about Continental, talking about our pride, and talking about Mr. Six. And I was really surprised when the LA Times published the entire letter. It ran for nearly a half a page. I didn't think much about it and the following day I was sitting in my office, I was working for an advertising agency at the time, I was sitting in my office and my secretary said, John there's a call for you. I picked up the phone and this deep voice says, John, very nice letter. I said, who's this? He said, Bob Six. Well, I could have absolutely, you could have knocked me over with a feather. The result of that conversation was, um, I've run much of my life, uh, as my dear wife knows, um, it, you know, too many people in life are afraid to ask, and I've always thought that if you don't ask, you'll never know, and the worst anyone can say to you is no. So Bob Six and I uh, started to have a series of lunches together. I remember the very first lunch that we have, here I was sitting with what is basically an aviation icon and legend. And I said, well, Mr. Six, he said, no, 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 John. He said, call me Bob. Well, I was so overwhelmed that I was sitting with this aviation legend, and to have him say to me, um, John, call me Bob, was really uh, very, very strange. He wrote me this letter, Dear John, thank you for your perfectly lovely, wonderful letter of July the 18th. I enjoyed having lunch and seeing you again and talking with you and remembering the old days at Continental. We had a really great airline and great people, and at least we had full recognition based on all the awards Continental and our various people received. Let's stay in touch and have lunch from time to time. Let me thank you for your last paragraph. At the present, there is nothing I need. I'd ask him if I could help him with anything. And he said, I'm grateful for your offer, and I would love to see you again. To have someone like that say to you, you know, let's have lunch again, it was really, it was an awe-inspiring moment for me and something that I will never, ever forget. I think the other thing about Continental that I always found uh, wonderful was the fleet that we had, going all the way back to the Lockheed Vega in 1934. And then a wonderful plane that I happened to fly when I was uh, working in England for British Airways, the Viscount. The Viscount was a wonderful aircraft. I liked it because it had very large windows and it had four engines that in those days they called jet powered. And then of course the DC-10 and the 727. I've always thought that one of the special things about Continental is our advertising. We had a wonderful, wonderful a series of ads. That was from the early 1970s. And another thing about Continental, I think we were very special because of the kind of people we employed. And there was one thing that I really loved. Uh, my youngest daughter, who is now living in Australia, sent me for a birthday present uh, about a year ago. This ad, the best run company in the sky, and our hostesses from United TWA, an American. 
They apparently loved our airline so much that they wanted to work for Continental Airlines. And I think that is a wonderful recognition of the kind of operation uh, that we ran. Working for Continental for me was sort of like a Walter Mitty job. If I imagined something that I wanted to do or love to do, um, I talked to my boss in PR and they let me do it. Continental, when it was based in LA, our hangar was right out at the end of the runway. And the Secret Service, when Air Force One used to come in, they put Air Force One in our hangar. They felt that it was the safest place. And so after a few visits of Air Force One, I said to myself, I've got to get on that airplane. I got to know some of the Secret Service guys. And then I think in the, I don't know, early 80s, it came in with Nixon. And by this time, I'd got to know the Secret Service guys very well. And so I said to my friend, I said, you know, is this the time we can get on board? And he said, absolutely. I had arranged with uh, him to take the then president of Continental, Al Feldman, on the airplane. The thing that amazed me about Air Force One was several things. First of all, when you saw that Air Force One, that Air Force One, the tail number on that plane was 26,000. It is the airplane that now resides in the Reagan Museum. But when you saw the presidents at some point in the world get off the plane, they always looked so relaxed and so healthy and so rested. And I thought, you know, when I get on the plane, there's got to be beds and all that other kind of stuff. There was absolutely nothing like that. When I went up the steps, and first of all, when you go up the steps, there was this huge, burly master sergeant standing there. And he looked at me and Al Feldman and he said, don't steal anything. <laughs> we will give you a package before you get off. Is that understood? <laughs> I said, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> when you got on that aircraft, when you turned in the door, immediately by the door, was this huge sort of doomsday switchboard on which the President of the United States could press any button and be an instant communication with any head of state of any other country in the world. And then next to it, sort of over on the left, was this very luxurious, comfortable sort of sitting room come dining room. And that is where the president, when he would uh, you know, go anywhere, that's, that's where he'd sleep. The interesting thing was that as you got further and further back in the airplane, it got less and less luxurious, and then right at the very back, that is where the press were. <laughs> um, <sighs> this is a book they gave you called Welcome Aboard, and it basically tells you all about Air Force One and what goes on there. Um, the package that I got, I don't remember all the things that I had, but there was this little booklet. And then, and they gave you a napkin. It just says aboard the presidential aircraft. It doesn't say Air Force One. It just says aboard the presidential aircraft. Um, I treasure these things because they're, you know, they're very unique and rare. And it was a real pleasure and a real thrill to get on Air Force One. Uh, I haven't been on the 747. Another thing that a lot of people don't know, uh, the 707 was one of three Air Force Ones. And I believe the 747, there are two 747s. Um, because we were, as I've said many times, a very unique airline, I wanted to, um, well, let me go back a bit. In the, um, let's see, about the middle 1970s, I belonged to the Continental Airlines Management Club. And one year, they asked me if I would be the program chairman. And I thought to myself, now, who else in the aviation industry is kind of unique? At that time, and I hope all of you here remember him, it was a wonderful man called Freddie Laker. 
he was knighted by the Queen and became Sir Freddie. So I thought to myself, I'm going to get Freddie Laker to come and speak to the Continental Airlines Management Club. Well, I wrote him letters and I even called him on the telephone and absolutely nothing, nothing happened. I got nowhere. And then one day when I was out walking around the Continental hangar, I looked up and there was a Continental DC-10 nose to nose with the Laker DC-10. I rushed back into my office, got my camera, came out and I shot a whole roll of film. Those were in the days when you had film. And I shot a whole roll of film, got all the pictures developed, they were in black and white, and out of the 34 pictures, I picked out the best, most interesting six photographs. I then pasted them all in a little book, and at the top of the Continental plane, I had a little bubble, and it said to the Laker plane, listen, I've tried for ages to get your boss to come here. When are you going to come? And the Laker plane would say, I don't know, I'm just an aeroplane. So, I put all these in, put them in an envelope, and sent it Federal Express to Freddie Laker. Based on what had happened previously, I was I wasn't sure what was going to happen, but then a week later, I got a letter in my office and it said, <laughs> just a note, I have, I will, as soon as I get the thing, I will come on the SkyTrain application, I will see you in Los Angeles. So Freddie Laker was going to come to the Continental Management Club. We eventually fixed something up, and when he arrived, I went to meet him at the terminal. He had just, the previous week, been knighted by the Queen, so he was now Sir. So when he came off the plane, and he was obviously the first off the plane, I went up to him, and I said, Sir Freddie, welcome to LA. He put his hand on my shoulder and looked me straight in the face and said, no, John, no, no, no. I'm still Freddie. Don't call me so. That was the kind of man that he was. Um, unfortunately, he's passed along. The man on the left there is Charles A. Bucks, the Senior Vice President of Marketing of Continental. And that obviously is Freddie Laker there, and that is me. Look at those sideburns, good heavens. Um, I show you that picture because that dinner, I was still in the sort of stage of being awestruck by uh, aviation legends. But that dinner, I, John Clayton, sat in the middle of this table, and on my left-hand side was Audrey Meadows, who was the wife of Bob Six, and a TV, you know, personality par extraordinaire, and my other side was Sir Freddie Laker. So I was absolutely uh, overwhelmed uh, at what had occurred. One of the uh, wonderful, again, wonderful things about Continental was, uh, as far as I was concerned, I could basically see and do almost anything that I wanted to do. And in 1968, Continental founded an organization called Air Micronesia. I don't know how many people in this room know where Micronesia is. We began service out there with a wonderful Continental Airlines captain called Dave Streit. And we had one 727, we had two of them. Um, the interesting thing about those aircraft was, due to the runways, and I'll show you something about that in a minute, due to the runways, we had extra heavy, specially reinforced tires, and the whole bottom of the aircraft was also reinforced. We began service in 1968, and around 1978, I decided to go out to Micronesia. I flew in a Continental DC-10 to Honolulu, and then I got off the plane, and I was looking around for the Air Micronesia counter, and then I saw this small little counter with one person, and I went up there, and I saw that big sign there, the legend of the golden tail, and I thought, well, this must be the place. And then I looked out the window, and I saw this small 727, the 727-100, 
And obviously I know how safe flying is. And I thought, I got this big plane here, and now I'm gonna fly over all this vast expanse of the Pacific in this small airplane. I mean, oh, why well, is that gonna be okay? I mean, what a dumb thing to say, because I knew that airplanes were very safe and everything was gonna be okay. The 727s that we operated, the front part of the airplane was had cargo, and a very unique thing. I wonder how many of you know what the other thing was. The other thing was that on every flight that we flew to Micronesia, we had a mechanic. We had a mechanic because if the plane, get this, if the plane broke down anywhere, he could get out and supposedly fix it. Um, the other thing is that the airline flew from Honolulu to a tiny little island called Johnson Island, which is basically a piece of concrete in the Pacific. Then it went to Truck. This is a shot of the runway at Truck. As you can see, you need to come down and land that baby very quickly. Dave Strike told me that the runway was a mile long. And so you better put that baby down as quick as you can and make sure you put the brakes on as soon as you can. Otherwise, you'd go off the end. But the other wonderful thing from a pilot point of view was that the 727 serving Micronesia, when I flew that trip and Dave Streit let me sit up front with him in the cockpit, he gave us a tour of a wonderful island called Peleliu, which uh, US Marines remember very well with brutal savagery from World War II. He then, before he landed a truck, gave us a tour of Truck Lagoon, and it was sort of a private trip in your own airplane. Again, I don't know how many people here know the significance of Truck. You have someone's willing it, nodding their head. Truck Lagoon was for the Japanese in World War II their equivalent of Pearl Harbor. On February the 16th and 17th, 1944, Uncle Sam's Navy discovered about 75% of the Japanese Navy at Truk. February the 16th, the 17th in 1944, Uncle Sam's Navy went there and destroyed 270 Japanese aircraft and 58 ships. The interesting thing about that now is that when you go to Truck Lagoon and all around there, you can get in a boat and you look down and there, right below you, I mean right below you, you can see Japanese freighters and airplanes and tanks and trucks. They've all been declared a National Historic Monument, so you're not allowed to take anything, but it is a very weird kind of feeling to see this great ship beneath you. Um, I'm not into scuba diving, but if you're into it and you want scubas, <laughs> <laughs> Cuba, scuba's paradise, I urge you to go to a truck. That's Dave Strike. We went to another island called Palau, and the interesting thing about this, that is a Japanese Zero um, that couldn't make land in World War II and had to ditch on a coral reef. It was about 500 yards from the shore, and the interesting thing was, when I went there in 1978, that you could get in that airplane and you could still move the flaps. It was absolutely incredible. Um, if you're into World War II and that kind of memorabilia, I would urge you to um, take a trip out there and see some of the things that exist in Micronesia. That is the... Continental Lounge, the Micronesian, the Polynesian pub. And I think one of the reasons that we, uh, the airline, were such a great airline was that we did things differently. Um, I actually, I was actually going to begin this segment by saying to you, what is the key to a Continental Airlines being such a unique airline? I think one of the many things was the fact of our employees, our flight attendants, and our pilots, and our mechanics. We offered a very special brand of service and something that was, uh, in my view, uh, very, very special.
We were all thrilled when uh, the Civil Aeronautics Board gave Continental the rights to fly to the South Pacific. In those days, the CAB really ran the airline business. They told us what you could do and what you couldn't do. And they awarded us, um, with a lot of prodding from President Johnson, the route to New Zealand and Australia. And as soon as someone called President Nixon came in, um, he took the routes away from us. Um, but I guess that is um, politics. We also had some very wonderful uniforms. And I am very proud to say that I have been able, with the help of the wonderful staff of this incredible museum, to show you some of the uniforms that made Continental's flight attendants unique. <laughs> I believe, is one of those yours? Yeah, the one with the red hat. The one with the red hat belonged to my wife. I always thought, and I still think, that that is, gosh, those were the days when uniforms were uniforms. Um, they were special, uh, they were unique, and they had a sense of class. And I don't think that today the, um, uniforms, you know, they all sort of meld into each other and it's very difficult to, um, I don't know, to, to distinguish one from another. Um, but anyway, um, during my career with Continental, I was very privileged in public relations to do a lot of different things. I was privileged to talk about um, the fuel crisis, our service, and such things as uh, hijackings. And fortunately, um, I only got to experience this once, but I'm gonna share something with you now uh, that, thank goodness, only happened once. If when we finished you go into that next room, you will see a display of all the Continental uniforms. It's a wonderful collection, uh, and I urge you to go take a look at it. As I say, I'm going to share something with you now um, that I'm glad I only had to uh, handle once. On March the 1st, 1978, which happened to be a Wednesday, um, it had rained very much during the night. Uh, although the runway wasn't flooded, uh, the runways had quite a few puddles. And in those days, and I think maybe still today, when it would rain kind of heavily, aircraft would take off to the east, that is to say over the land and not out over the ocean. Runway 6R, which is on the right side of the airport, is 10,264 feet long. Continental had a flight 603 that day, and 603 at one minute to nine o'clock that day left the gate and went out to the end of the runway and waited for takeoff instructions. At 9.22, Continental Flight 603 was given the okay to take off. She had 184 passengers on board, the majority of whom were senior citizens, going on a trip of a lifetime to Honolulu, Hawaii, and there were 14 crew members. Continental Flight 603, tail number N68045, began her takeoff roll down the runway. Halfway down the runway in 1978, there was a fast station. It was called Fast Station 80. When our airplane was exactly opposite that fast station, <coughs> the left main landing gear, and so you know what the landing gear is, those are things with all the wheels and the, <laughs> yeah. And uh, the DC-10 had four wheels on the left, four wheels on the right, and two wheels in the nose gear. As our aeroplane got right by the fast station, and the captain didn't hear this, the left outer tire exploded. Milliseconds later, the other tire next to it also exploded. In the airline industry, there is something called V1 and V2. V1 is the speed at which an aeroplane can stop safely. V2 is the speed at which an aeroplane must, must take off. The other interesting thing about this flight, 
This flight was the very final last flight of our captain. And it was a tradition in Continental, maybe in all airlines, but on your last flight as captain, you get to take your wife with you. It just so happened that while all this was happening, as it passed fast station 80, the captain of the fast station saw and heard this, and he went inside and told the fire crews, get ready for an accident. When the third tire blew, the landing gear strut collapsed, and I'm, I don't know again how many of you know this, but when you fly, you think about all the fuel in an airplane. An airplane has its fuel in both wings and also very often in the belly. Therefore, with the weight of the landing gear collapsing, the wing collapsed and the airplane careened down to the end of the runway and burst into flames. I got there about a half an hour afterwards. That's how it looked. That is how the nose looked. But that is on the right side of the aircraft. That is the left side. That's the cockpit. That's the wing. And that's uh, lifting one of our proud birds out of the uh, area. I, again, I don't know if you know this, <clears throat> but any time an airline has, um, they use a lot of really, you know, wonderful sort of public relations expressions. They never say accident or uh, they have things like failure to get off the ground, those sorts of words. Um, <laughs> Any airline that has a failure to get off the ground situation, they always paint out and get rid of the name of the airline. So we, Continental, wanted to get rid of our aircraft as soon as possible. What an incredible shot that is. You know, I wonder for the people in our other plane taking off, what they must have thought as they looked out and said, wait a minute, I'm in a Continental proud bird, and here's it, I mean, yeah, um, very, very strange, and that's just a picture I took uh, for the record books, as it were. As I said, I had a really Walter Mitty existence at Continental, and one day I decided it would be really interesting to get in one of our aircraft early in the morning and follow it throughout the whole day to see where that one aeroplane went. And the captain I flew with, Captain Lee Lipsky, uh, he allowed me to sit up front with him, which is absolutely incredible. And that is a shot uh, leaving the, or getting in line at LAX. I also uh, had cause to go to Seattle when we um, ordered six aircraft. And that was a wonderful, very interesting experience because when I got to Seattle, we got to this big Boeing dining room and there was a few, there was about six Continental executives and about six Boeing executives and of course about six banking executives who put the whole deal together. When the whole thing was signed and sealed, we'd all noticed that sitting in front of us was a little box, this box. And this Boeing executive said, all right, ladies and gentlemen, you can now open the box. I opened the box and it is a key to a 727. It is sterling silver and it was just a wonderful memory. I mean, obviously, yeah, you don't start an airplane with a key, but it was a wonderful uh, memory for me to, uh, to get that. Another time, I went up to Seattle to do a story on how Continental, what's called handled British Airways. That means to say that every time a British Airways flight came into Seattle, Continental employees would take care of everything. The, the British Airways didn't need to have a, a British Airways staff there. So while I was talking to the captain in the operations room, he and I got on very well together. And as he was leaving the room, he turned around to me and said to me, I say, John, uh, would you like to come with us? And I thought, well, and then he started for the door, and then he turned around and he said, oh, by the way, he said, I mean, sit with us in the cockpit. 
Well, I just about died and went to heaven. I mean, woo! Incredible. <laughs> that particular flight left Seattle, flew to San Francisco, came back to Seattle, and then went to London. Um, I regret to say that I was so thrilled and so excited to get up there with the captain, I completely forgot to call my wife who thought, my goodness, what's happened to my honey? And um, she was really concerned, but obviously everything worked out because we're both still here. But the reason for my telling you this story is as follows. I don't know how many of you have been privileged or lucky enough to sit in the cockpit on takeoff, but let me briefly, briefly describe for you that trip in the 747. As I sat behind the captain, he gave me a pair of headphones to hear everything. And as I sat there, I could sort of hear the four powerful Rolls-Royce engines sort of saying, let me show you what I can do, let me show you what I can do. And then the American controller came on and said, BA heavy. And just so you know, if you don't know what that means, BA is obviously British Airways. And every big airplane in aviation language is called a heavy. So this American voice came on and said, BA heavy, cleared for takeoff. And then the captain turned around and said, all right, gentlemen, here we go. <coughs> and to sit there in this huge aeroplane, and when you sit in a 747, it's amazing how high up off the ground you are. It's absolutely an amazing feeling. And then the captain brought the engines up to full power, released the brakes, and then slowly, and then faster, and faster, and faster, the plane roared down the runway, and I was sitting there absolutely in seventh heaven. I couldn't hardly believe it. And then the end of the runway approached, and then boom, we rose slowly into the sky, and then we went through a bank of clouds, and the most amazing thing is, we came up on the other side, and above us was just blue, blue sky, and below us, as far as you could see, was like a mass of cotton wool. And I said to myself, oh dear Lord, how wonderful this is. I'm sure pilots just love, love, love their job. What an incredible, ah, what an incredible job they have. So it was, uh, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, <clears throat> When airlines start new routes, it is a really boring, boring thing. And one day, my vice president of public relations, Joe Daly, said to me, John, we would like you to go to Denver and set up some press publicity for the start of service from Continental in Denver to San Jose, to San Francisco, to Washington, D.C., and Las Vegas. I got there on Sunday and I went into our reservations office and I picked out a good looking girl and I dressed her as a show girl. I picked another guy and dressed him as a cable car guy. I got another guy and dressed him as George Washington and then I dressed another guy as a computer. And on Monday, I took all of them to every television and radio station in Denver and every newspaper. And the publicity that we got was absolutely incredible for really a boring, boring event. I was going to follow this on Wednesday with Roger Ringler was our vice president in Denver and he had a really offbeat sense of humor like I do. And I said to him, you know, what I'd like to do is dress you up as a Roman chieftain and dress you up in a toga and then have a big marching band and we'll march you into this big stadium in Denver and then you can stand up there and proclaim to the masses the new roots of Continental. And everything was set. And when I awoke on Wednesday morning, Denver was enveloped in the worst biggest snowstorm in Denver's history. Well, I didn't have a plan B because they told me the weather in Denver was always going to be fine. Well, eventually we actually went to um, a restaurant and got everything uh, sorted out, but it was a really interesting, uh, uh, interesting event. Continental played uh, its part in lots of different movies. Movie companies would come and shoot in our hangars. And then one day I got a call from a gentleman 
who introduced himself as Stanley Kubrick's um, location manager for an upcoming movie called The Shining with Jack Nicholson. And he said to me, you know, uh, Stanley Kubrick um, wants to have everything absolutely, you know, true to course with Continental. Um, could you give us some footage of one of your planes taking off from Miami going to Denver, and if, I don't know if you ever saw the movie, but there is a scene where that happens, and there is a black gentleman on the flight. He said to me, this location manager said, Stanley wants to make sure that in the pictures, every flight attendant has the right tie, the right buttons, the right this, that, and the other. And so we went to an enormous amount of work to make sure that we got everything right. Now, you would have to be an airline employee to know this, but when the movie came out, you saw this Continental DC-10 take off from Miami, and when it landed in Denver in a snowstorm, it was a Lockheed 1011. <laughs> now again, you'd have to be an airline person to know that, but any person who worked for Continental, you know, it was, um, it was kind of sad. The other interesting thing about Stanley Kubrick, I don't know whether you knew this, but Stanley Kubrick was absolutely terrified, terrified of flying. And if you saw the movie, everything that you saw that was in that hotel was shot at Elstree Studios outside London in England. And when I went down there, they actually offered me a trip down to the studios, which I took, and they showed me the doors that Jack Nicholson had hacked into. Uh, so any movie that Stanley Kubrick made, um, it was always shot uh, somewhere else. Um, those were indeed the good old days of Continental, and I'm really glad that I could be part of all that magic. Um, I'm very proud of, uh, of what I was uh, doing there. Oh, I'm getting choked up here. Um, in 1980, uh, Bob Six retired, and a search went on to find a leader of Continental. They eventually decided on Al Feldman. Al Feldman was a guy who had never lost anything in his life. He was always the number one guy. He was president of uh, Aerojet General, president of Frontier Airlines, and of course president of Continental. When uh, a terrible man called Frank Lorenzo started to pull Continental Airlines apart, very slowly and then rather quickly, Lorenzo gained an advantage and an advantage and an advantage over Continental. And all the strengths that we had legally and everything came falling apart and Al Feldman started to fall apart because he had never lost a battle in his life. Um, in late July, I was part of a group of about 20 Continental executives that went to a party that he had organized in his condominium in uh, Marina del Rey. And he told us, now he told us, listen to this, he told us that when his wife died, and she died about a month ago, a month previously, he said, I am going to fall apart. That from a top executive, and indeed he did fall apart. On August the 9th, which was a Sunday in 1981, Al Feldman had scheduled a meeting with about 20 of Continental's pilots to see if we could figure out a way to stop Lorenzo. The pilots didn't finish their conversation with Feldman, and they said to, they said to uh, Feldman, can we see you this afternoon? Now in view of what I'm gonna tell you in a minute, listen to Feldman's reply. He said, I'm very sorry, I can't meet you this afternoon because I have a previous engagement. The pilots left, Al Feldman got in his car, went back to his condominium in Marina del Rey, had something to eat, came back to the Continental headquarters and lay down on a sofa in his office. Before I tell you what the next part is, when he joined Continental, he said to me, um, do you have a really dramatic picture of some Continental aeroplane? So I said to him, yes, I do. I said, I recently shot some pictures uh, of our newest proud bird. 
This uh, was a Continental DC-10-30, and that was the one that could go non-stop across the Pacific. When I got it for him, he said to me, John, have two made. Bring one to my office and keep this one for yourself. When he had it framed in his office, he put it directly above the sofa. It was the same sofa, the same office that Robert Six had had. That Sunday, he went back to the office, lay down on the sofa underneath this picture, and put a pistol in his mouth and killed himself. Um, it was a very sad end to a very caring, he played a big part in our life. Um, he played a big part in our life and uh, I, was, uh, I, was, I was devastated when he, when he did that. We, uh, even though Feldman was gone, we were urged by other people at Continental to orchestrate as many demonstrations as we could um, to stop Lorenzo. And one day the company hired six, six buses, filled them all with employees, and we were all bused downtown LA. And um, we were trying to get Governor Brown to introduce some legislation to keep Continental, Continental, and out of Lorenzo's hands. And that is just uh, part of, uh, part of um, you know, that demonstration. Unfortunately, nothing happened because uh, Lorenzo eventually um, persevered and everything uh, came to, uh, to a sad end for Continental. Um, before I close my presentation, I want to do two things. Um, there is a certain magic about flying, and when you sit in the cockpit of an airplane, you really get that feeling. And I'd like to read a ten-line poem that most airline people, especially flight crew, know. It's called High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the surly bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter-silvered wings. Sunward I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split cows and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of. Wheeled and soared and swung, hung in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my eager craft through the footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace. Where near lark or eagle flew, and while with silent lifting mind I've trod, the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, I put my hand and touched the face of God. Um, gosh, I always get choked up when I, uh, when I read that. Before I close, uh, two things. When I was on LA radio, um, I was on LA radio for 16 years and I found that uh, many radio personalities had sort of signatures and I decided that my signature would be my socks. And when I finished here, if you want to ask me to show you, I will. On my left foot I had a British sock and then on my right I had an American sock. And so I became known uh, in the uh, radio community as the sock guy. And the reason I did that was that I was very proud to have been born in England, but I'm even more proud to live and work in this great country called America. Um, <clears throat> after Mr. Lorenzo devastated Continental, a wonderful gentleman called Gordon Bethune came along. Gordon Bethune was with Continental from 1994 to 2004. Gordon Bethune took this airline from absolutely nothing and made it, according to Forbes magazine, one of the 100 best companies in the world to work for. Not once, not twice, not three times, but five times. Um, he left. But during his reign in 1994, another gentleman who ended up being 15 years with Continental called Jeff Smyzik came along. And Jeff Smyzik is now the top gentleman at United. And I have a very good friend here called Anthony Toth who is sitting right there. 
Anthony Toth was the kind gentleman who um, supplied me with the billboards that you saw coming in then. I want to just share with you a very quick thing about Anthony. Anthony is a top executive with United. He's been with United 26 years. He has a high executive position with United. He has five people working for him. And he absolutely blew my wife and I away when he invited us out to the city of industry to see, are you ready for this? To see a 747 of Pan Am in his garage. <laughs> now wait a minute, you say a 747 in the garage? Anthony has been an aviation aficionado like my wife and I all these years and what he has there is the inside first class nose section of a Pan Am 747. It is absolutely amazing and when my wife and I went there, my wife immediately went to the galley and she said, honey, I feel quite at home here. I mean, it was absolutely extraordinary. And then as an aviation freak myself, Anthony said to me and my wife, he said, John, I want you to come upstairs. We went upstairs and there my dear good friend Anthony has, at a guess, I would say 10,000 pieces of crockery and cookware and plates and saucers to do with about 30 different airlines around the world. So afterwards I hope that you will go and talk to Anthony and ask how you can arrange to have a function um, at his aircraft. Okay, I'm going to uh, close this presentation with something that, um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for coming. It's uh, been a pleasure having here. Um, uh, I actually am so in love with Continental. I, I love doing this kind of thing, and I would love to stand here for the next three or four hours, but I know you all have things to do. I'm going to close this presentation with a 60-second Continental Airlines commercial. And my question to Mr. Smizek, when you see this, please bear in mind this. Can Mr. Smizek inject what you will see in a minute, that same sort of enthusiasm that you will see in this 60 second commercial, can he inject into them, all the people at United who worked for United before Continental, can he inject into them this same kind of enthusiasm? Airline competition is getting tougher. Good. Continental thrives on it. If you think we moved our tail before, well, you should see us now. We'd like to take a bow. Cause when it comes to pleasing people, we know how. We like the folks who fly to see for a friend. The way our first-rate service will make them come back. All we can say is, wow, you ought to see us now. I want to share one final thing with you that I forgot. Um, in the whole course of my time with Continental, one of the real sort of, you know, standing on a precipice thing was when, when there was a possibility of a merger with Western Airlines. Uh, the interesting thing about that was that I personally think we would have made a good a good marriage together. The reason we did that was that deregulation was coming in and we felt both of us would be a lot stronger together. However, um, the CAB and life events happened uh, that it didn't uh, work out. And thank goodness, Continental Airlines remained Continental. <laughs> thank you very much.